Come on. I think we're on. Yeah, our intro <laughs> didn't play. I don't know what just happened. Um, okay, <laughs> hi. Welcome to uh, episode 185 of the Comic Watchers show. I'm Matt. This is Chad. And uh, we usually have an intro instead of just dumbfounded silence. So thank you for bearing with our, our technical uh, foolishness. Um, we are, this week, talking to author Fred Kennedy of Image's new Dead Romans miniseries, possibly an ongoing series at some point down the road, depending on how the first uh, our six issues do. But um, it is an awesome historical fiction based at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest at yeah. the height of the <laughs> Roman Empire, or possibly the beginning of the end. Uh, I don't want to get into spoilers, but Fred, yeah. welcome. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. After our technologically inept beginning. Um, <laughs> I love live broadcasting, man. This is like, great, so great. good. Yeah, it's not like we're live broadcasting. Whatever. Yeah, it's fine. It's great. That it's because I'm, cool. I'm in West Virginia. <laughs> That's Yes, yes. It's uh, West Virginia's fault, and we're just going to leave it at that. Fred, welcome. Um, Dead Romans is pretty unique. Amongst the amid the comic scene, um, it as historical fiction. Uh, what is the elevator pitch, so to speak, for this series? It is a romance. It is a love story that is set in a dark and horrific, brutal massacre of Roman soldiers. It's like the worst defeat the Roman Empire ever suffered. Uh, if not the largest on scale, it is definitely one of the most impactful. And we decided to put a love story in the midst of this horrific event where tens of thousands upon people are dying over the course of a few days. So I, I want to get into the comic. Um, tell us a little bit first for context. Tell us a little bit about the battle of Teutoburg, T Teutoburg forest, because it's a pretty significant historical event, especially within the context of the uh, Roman empire. Um, yeah. But I'm going to assume there's a lot of people that maybe don't know about it. So one of the things about the Roman Empire um, was that they, for hundreds of years, lived in fear of the north. And then they refused to go north. They refused to fight the Gauls. They refused to fight the Germanic peoples because uh, around like 400 BC, the Gauls invaded northern Italy, came in and massacred, looted, destroyed Rome, etc. So they were like the boogeyman. Uh, and then Julius Caesar, because there was nowhere else for him to go, he went up north, the Gallic Wars and all that stuff happened. And when he conquered Gaul uh, and then conquered Gaul again, um, he decided that they were going to march eastward and they were going to march into Germania. And a lot of the Gauls who had been at war with Rome were very pro this because the Germanic peoples had been invading across the Rhine and butchering and enslaving and looting etc for generations and so going across the Rhine bringing the fight to them ooh, this is a good thing and so eventually uh they were in the process of establishing Germania as a full Roman province and they sent a guy uh by the name of Varus into Germania to be the governor and he brought with him this dude by the name of Arminius Hermanus um and Arminius was a Germanic prince. He was a prince from the Sharutsi tribe. And the Sharutsi were one of the largest, most powerful tribes. And in the process of this uh, defeating of the Germanic peoples, uh, they took hostages. So one of the things Rome would do is they would take the children of the powerful people and they would send them back to Rome. And it wasn't like they were sent back to Rome in shackles. Uh, they were sent back to Rome to be raised as Roman nobility, with the idea being, this is why you lost, take these lessons back to your people, and then you can join the empire and become part of all the wonderful things the Roman empire has to offer. And so Arminius was one of these guys who just got it. And he was a really skilled general, and he was a really skilled tactician and warrior, and he had universal respect amongst the Roman peoples. And uh, by his own merit, he achieved the rank of a keat, which is like uh, the equivalent of like a knight. And he was the commander of the, the auxiliary 
the cav all of the cavalry. He was the guy. And so when he went to Germania, he thought, wow, I'm going to do great things for my people. But when he got there, he found that they were being crucified and they were being exploited and they were being brutalized by the Roman Empire. They were under the heel. And so he decided, this isn't what I fought for. I know how to beat the Romans. So in secret, he united uh, around 20 tribes, 20, 30 tribes, some big, some small. And he basically told them, we've all got blood feuds with each other. I know you all hate each other because this guy stole a cow from your grandfather and now you have to murder him. But just put that aside. Follow me. Do what I say. And we are going to drive Rome out of here forever. And that's what he did. Uh, because after uh, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, the Romans did go in again, but they never even attempted to turn Germania into a province. There was... Uh, restitution that was given when Germanicus came in a few, like a decade later. Um, but they never turned Germania into a province of Rome again after that. And so if you want to talk about impact that this battle had from a historical context, there's the great language line in Europe where you look at the Rhine and everything East is Germanic. Everything West is Romanic, French, Spanish, and all those other languages all derive from Rome, and it's like the profound historical impact of this one battle uh, in September of 09 AD is just profound. So, yeah, and we decided to take that and put a love story in it. That's what we did. It sounds pretty ready made for a movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, it really does. Um, in terms of execution, you've got. A fabulous artist named Nick Marinkovic yeah. working with you. And I know that you basically had the, the the first arc and a little beyond because I know you had to modify a little bit, um, but plotted out, but not necessarily scripted. Um, looking at it as now a partnership, once Nick comes on in terms of execution, did he make it with his uh with his style, like a little easier to think in terms of that broad sweeping scope, a sort of cinematic feel to it. Absolutely. Uh, the thing about Nick is that Nick is Nick's. Well, he's really good. <laughs> he's really good. kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's very, <laughs> very fortunate, uh, and he really got the subtleties because we were very vocal from the beginning. The linchpin of this story is. Arminius and Honoria and their need to be together. And the idea was, we, we talked a lot about uh, 28 Days Later uh, mm. and how, remember at the end of that movie, it's this horrific, vile scenario and the need of those two characters to find each other in the midst yeah. of this chaos, to become the chaos, to find each other that drive and there's like a real passion there. And I think from the worst situations comes the best of humanity. Yeah. Um, and so that was a, some of the things we talked about a lot. And so he really made sure to not lose that raw emotion, uh, not just the horror elements of the story when he was putting the art out. So that was really good. I have to say, if you're talking in terms of sculpting the story, Alison O'Toole, our editor, yeah. She's the best there is. She's the best. She's just, I, I will fly the Allison O'Toole flag forever and ever and ever because she's so <laughs> good. And there was a lot of times, and I, and I know that like when you're a creator and you don't have an editor with you, it feels like you're shooting in the dark. Yeah. And it can be terrifying because you don't know where those bullets are landing. And then you've got someone like her who comes in. She's like, what do you want to do? And there's things that you get gun shy about, things that you're terrified to do creatively. And then she's like, do them just do them and you're like i'm going to do them i'm gonna do right? all of the things and working with her was great and this this is like the working with the two of them together what was amazing was nick's such a beast there's nothing i can't throw at him that he can't get convey like he's just convey it like i want to let you in on conversations we were having today but i'm not going to <laughs> like it, it like it just he gets the what's important. And for me, a lot of times when I'm breaking down a panel, I'll write, this is what's happening. This is what is important and needs to come across. And Nick always just nails it. He's so good at it. 
And I, and like, I, I big kudos to Jim Valentino and Shadowline uh, for letting us do this story. And there's so many people I think that would have forced us into like a, a pigeonhole of no, I want a violent, brutal story. Just, I want violence and, and do chaos. 300 again. Yeah. And like <laughs> Jim was very supportive. Like, Everyone at Shadowline has been so great with us about how, you know, do the love story, make it that connection, make it unique, make it different. That's what we want you bringing mm -hmm. to it. So I'm incredibly, incredibly fortunate to be with the people. And Jose Villarubia, like the the colors, because he does the, uh, Jose does the colors from uh, issue two onwards. And oh. his colors are absolutely fantastic. So Nick did the colors on the first one, but then, for the sake of his workload, we, we brought in Jose, which is, well, dude, that's a get, you know? Right. Jose, yeah, yeah, that's a get. Because like, Nick, of course, about that? <laughs> Nick is friends with Jose. Of course he is. He's, I'm like, <laughs> we need to get some colors, a colorist. And he goes, I know a guy. And he's like, do you know Jose Villarubia? The, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. And he, Jose does a, a variant cover for us for issue five. And oh, oh. my God, it's so good. It's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Chad, why don't you jump in, man? Oh, I was just going to kind of ask, uh, do you have a history background? Because you seem to be very um, knowledgeable about that period of time. No, I don't have, a, I don't even have a community college, man. I don't even have a high school diploma. <laughs> if, if you want, like, the, if you want the truth. Uh, I had an option of getting my high school diploma if I finished off paying my high school fees, but they gave me a diploma holder that said diploma will be issued upon payment of high school fees. And I kept that instead because I thought that was cooler than the actual diploma. Uh, no, it's I, very I, fun. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we moved to Canada from Belgium when I was 12, and we, we lived in this area where the Belgii clan were. And the Belgii are mentioned a lot in Julius Caesar's books about the Gallic Wars because they were horrible to fight because they didn't surrender and they were really, really mean. Uh, and we went, we went on a school trip when I was in like the fourth grade to this recreated Roman villa. And when I recreated, it was more like a recreated uh, Belgii village by a, what was a Roman settlement. Uh, and they had like the, you know, the glass laid out over top so you could look in and you could see and you were inside. And there was like, I remember this was one of those first moments where you feel, you can feel the history. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like the hill that Julius Caesar mentions where he almost lost. That's the hill. It's right there. And you're just, you're little and you're standing on this hill and you're like, oh my God, that's really cool. Like, and you know who Julius Caesar is and you're like, he could have been standing right here. So that was like a real connection to history. And then, and I, it was a bit of a sidebar. I honestly feel like the internet not existing for most of my childhood played a definite role in my understanding of these things. And I say that because my kids can watch whatever they want to watch on TV. They can watch whatever they want to watch whenever they want to watch it. So they watch all their cartoons and their silly stuff that they love, which is great. I love it. Awesome. Fill your boots, man. But when we were growing up, that wasn't an option. So when I would, we couldn't watch a kid's show, I would like throw on, I loved anything with like swords and battles and all that stuff. So I would watch these documentaries on Discovery and TLC and all that stuff uh, of like the Roman Empire and, and all that. And you just start to learn about it very passively but like you plant those little seeds and i mentioned in a few interviews about reading asterix and obelisk comics as a kid <laughs> and i do legitimately believe that that played a huge role in my interest in ancient history like i i i can't downplay it at all i think it's profoundly impactful those little things like my youngest is getting right into conan i gave him the the kurt busick carrie nord books uh, well, I, I let him take them from my office and he started <laughs> reading them and he's like, cause remember the very first one has Conan as a little kid. Yeah. And it's like, he's reading Conan as a little kid. And then he's like, how old is he supposed to be? I'm like, he's your age. And he's like, Oh, this is so cool. And I'm like, it is so cool. So just those little yeah. things about being supportive and giving them like something to read and check out, I think is pretty dope. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so how do you, like, why to, okay, so why?
Why what? You froze. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, I hope. Yeah, it was the internet. Okay. Well, my Wi-Fi is kind of shitty, so it was. Ask we're just gonna I'm right here. I'm ready to go. Uh, so, well, just in terms of da- of this telling the medium for telling this story, like what makes comics right for it rather than television or prose? Well, let me tell you, if Jeff Bezos calls me tomorrow and says he wants to do a series, I'm not opposed to the idea. <laughs> but I did come up with the idea initially of doing it as a comic because I really wanted some something that was like had a, had a timeless vibe on the paper mm-hmm. and on the page. And I really love the look of that Romanesque, iconic imagery on paper. And when I I batted the idea around about doing it for a while, but it's always like, is that you have a sense when you're pitching of like, I can't pitch what I really want to do. You know what I mean? Like I, I talked to so many creators like that and they spend so much time trying to find a story that will like click with the current right. climate of things. And, th- and I didn't believe that dead Romans would land. I just, I, I was kind of like, this is the last, this is the last thing I got <laughs> in the tank. I'm just going to throw it on the wall. And so it finally did like land after a while. And I was super stoked and I just wanted to do something that could sit on the shelf and have a timeless look to it. And I, and I think that mm-hmm. a lot of times when you have a, a movie or a TV show, not always, but sometimes they can inevitably look dated. Um, and I didn't want that. And I knew that if you're doing it as a comic, you can draw it as amazing as you want. There's no budgetary influence. There's no stylized. Right. It's going to draw the way it is. And the stylish aspects of it come from the writing and come from the artist. And so once I saw Nick's art, I, I'd heard of Kank, but once I saw him showing his book, The Voyager, I was like, that is the guy. But I was very intimidated to talk to Nick because he's really good. Uh, and it was Kalman Andrushovsky who really was like, he's the guy. He, it was like we're at a dance in high school. And he was like, I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you, man. Like, he was the guy that was like, go talk. Go talk. Like, okay. So I went over and sheepishly bought Nick's book. And then uh, we soft pitched. And then we talked online after. And then we met up for drinks. And then it was... We didn't even really talk money. And I've said this a few times. We didn't even really talk money until we were like leaving after like, this is going to be so great. And he's like, oh, what about money? I'm like, well, how much do you want for the pitch? He's like, this much. I'm like, okay, let's get That's what we're done. We're all on the the same page here. Let's go. Yeah, that was it. That was it for me, man. That's awesome. So uh, what what has you guys, go since he came on, uh, what is your and Nick's working relationship, the ebb and flow of it kind of been like? I sometimes like because like and I, I say that I, yeah. I say that like this was your baby, and now you're having to share custody of your baby. Yeah. So what has that been like from a creative standpoint? Because I know um, it's a lot more than just you know Nick do this art. Yeah. It, well, it's all it's the thing was is that we got to know each other's styles as we worked on it. And so at first, and and Nick said this before, he said when he was first working on it, he would make a lot of changes to what I was sending him without thinking, oh, it doesn't matter. I I know best. And then now we're at the point where the page panel counts and everything like pretty much line up. But I'm very loosey-goosey with with when Mm -hmm. I script. And, And I've always told him like, listen. If it, you think it's too decompressed and you want to take these three panels and put them into one and you can make it work, send me the thumbs. And if it works, <laughs> I'm fine with it. And if you want to take right. this one panel and expand that, then go ahead. Absolutely. And then we, we talk a lot about um, trying to get historical Easter eggs into things. And I think that's the sure. thing where we click the most on it. Because um, we were talking before we went to air about how the one of the most frustrating aspects of it is trying to include... It's almost, okay. It's so whenever I'm doing like an interview with like a musician or a creator or anything, I always want to drop little notes so that they know that I know who they are. You know, they know I'm a fan. I want them to know that I'm mm-hmm. a fan. But there's right, sometimes right. in the process of doing that, 
yeah, in the process of doing that, you can kibosh the interview. You can make it terrible <laughs> by doing that. And I'm worried that like that is what can end up happening by throwing these little too much historical tidbits. But with Nick, we'll put space in the panel and we'll include little things so that all the real nerds will know <laughs> that we did our research and it's in there in the background. And so part of me, if someone's like, you didn't really show a lot of the earthworks that the German tribes did when they were rolling along the road in uh, Tudorberg, I'm like, ah, 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 issue three, page four, panel six, <laughs> you take a closer look in the bottom left, you'll see exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> we knew what was going on. So yeah, like that's the big thing. I think mine and Nick's relationship is he has an understanding of doing what is important uh, from not only a story perspective, but to give credence and credit to the story. Because I think we get caught up in this idea of like, well, man, it's so rad. So many thousands of people died. And it's like, maybe they should be a bit respectful. You know, like I know it's thousands right. of years ago, but it's still like there is like there is a question of being respectful to the cultures that are involved in this story. I think that's really yeah. important to do. So how long does it, how long does it take you to script an issue? I'm really fast. Um, I, I, and I'm not saying that like, I'm so good, like not, not in that sense, but I'm just, I'm really fast uh, when I'm writing in the sense that, I fall into like a pocket and then I can't get out until I get it done. And I get really focused on what I'm doing. So to map my process is if I'm taking my time and I want to do it right, it'll take me about, about four days to like map out and script an issue. Like, and that's, that's from nothing to finish first draft. Uh, and then I'll send it to Allison and whenever, and I don't know if I'm weird in this, but I have, like, I have a weird sense that when I get notes from my editor, I'm like, well, I better get those corrections done right away so that they know I'm serious. <laughs> and so then I get the notes and then I feel that I need to get like, I need to get it done as soon as they give it to me. Like I get it done because I hate having something sitting on the stove half cooked. You know what I mean? It's got to get done. Finish it, ship it, finish it, ship it, get it off. And when it's sitting there with notes on it, you've got the Google Doc with all the highlighted stuff and all that stuff. I'm like, no, 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 I got to get this done. So I clean it off and get it looking pristine. Then it goes off to Nick. One thing that I do like to do uh, in terms of a writing process for, for the creative, we've got uh, Andrew Thomas doing our letters, by the way. Great guy, great artist and great letterer. Um, and what I will do is I will letter everything out rough. I'll put the letters in little rough bubbles and then I'll space it around on the page and I'll get it to look. And I like to take a look at the letters on the page. And that's when I do my final lettering pass. I'll do my final lettering edit it when I see it on the page because there are times where it looks different in the script than it does on the page. And I don't know if maybe I'm just new, new, um, and I'm not doing the workload that a lot of these heavy hitters are doing, but when I see it on the page, that's when I'll make my final lettering pass, like for all the dialogue, changing little things. Cause I'm weird about using the same noun twice on a page. I don't know what that is, but like it, it, it stands out and drives me batty. I don't know what the problem is. It just drives me bonkers. I can't help it. It means you paid you attention in English class at some point. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Blewett is very happy with me right now. She's very happy. Thank you, Mrs. Blewett. Exactly. London Junior High, grade nine English <laughs> teacher in Edmonton. You're the best. Thank you. Now, do you when you're when you're writing, do you find it hard to transfer from like the modern day way of talking to, you know, how they may have talked, you know, or you know, how they would have, you know, spoken or, you know, no, I interacted. Love it. I love that. I love that sense of dialogue. And I, okay. Ed Brisson is, is one of my friends and I got him to read uh, one of my scripts that I had done. It was actually the first pitch that I had with Shadowline that actually went the distance. Uh, it ended up not landing in the end, but that was how I got in touch with Jim Valentino at first. That's where mm -hmm. we built rapport. Um, and I remember when Ed was reading that script, he stopped and he looked over and he goes, you certainly like this old-timey talk, don't you? And I was like, <laughs> I do. 
<laughs> because Ed is like the most vernacular blue collar dialogue. I love the way he writes dialogue. I, I'm a huge yes. Grissom fan. It's very, it's very like blue collar. That's a good. Yeah, that's a good fit. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when he was reading mine, he just like you really like this, don't you? And I was like, I do really like it. I'm sorry. So <laughs> I find it very easy to slip into that. Uh, and I will mutter to myself when I write dialogue. Uh, I forget who said it. I don't know. I, like, I, It might have been Ernest Hemingway that said when they were writing dialogue, they like to read the dialogue out loud to hear themselves say it. Because when you hear it said, then you really can tell if it's good dialogue or not. And so I almost like, feel like, like I'm muttering it to myself when I'm reading, you know? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. And I guess, I guess when you're dealing with a, uh, you know, 2000 year old vernacular, <laughs> it yeah. makes a difference. Um, I mean, you certainly want it to be penetrable to modern readers without sounding like um, Stan Lee scripted Thor. For yeah, lack of a better person. Uh, <laughs> the, the vernacular thing, like, is a is a huge. That was one of the biggest linchpins and toughest things about writing the book was the. And I mentioned this in an in interview before. Was like cursing. Whenever they curse, they they always they always bring up their gods. They always mention their gods. And then, where are they from? What year is is this? what were the gods worshipped in that area at that time? And then those are the things to me that stick out like a sore thumb to make sure that those little pieces all lined up properly. That was something that I really focused in a lot. Like when you're talking, was it hard to write in that voice? Not so much hard on what to include. Absolutely. A lot of like, there was one time there was one scene and this happens. I think this happens in issue four or five, five. And one of them just says a passing mutters a curse. And I spent about an hour backtracking and trying to verify what God they would be mentioning at this time. And it became a real frustration for me to, to think that like I could possibly have all this stuff done. And then this one thing destroys all my credibility. So I was like really, really <laughs> focused on those things. Like, I, that's the way I am. And it's like, and I say that because that's the way I know I am about things. And I can still enjoy mm -hmm. something, but I'll never, for, like here, perfect example. Rogue One from Star Wars. I love Rogue One. I think it's amazing. I think it's so good. And when they go on Scarif and they land and they get the Imperial uniforms, Diego Luna did not shave when he got off of the ship. And there is no way an officer in the Imperial Navy or Army would not be clean shaven and they're walking around in their uniform that would not fly and to this day that's the only thing about that movie that i will point out that <laughs> bugs me and irks me but it bugs me and i still love it i still love it i do listen rogue I, one vastly underappreciated yeah and and then well, I, I even I, better after watching andor <laughs> yeah and i'm like why couldn't you just shave just shave like that's what that's the detail. Like to me, they should like, and it should have been Riz Ahmed. Should have been the one like you, you should, you should, you should shave. And he's all like, all messed up from the the mind thing that happened to him. He should have like been the one to point it out. <laughs> Honestly, I've never seen a better performance in a Star Wars production than Riz Ahmed in Rogue One. He acted the <laughs> pants off of that role. The pilot, oh, I love him. I love Riz Ahmed and everything he does though. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so so. Circling back to the, the authenticity of your historical drama and its many and sundry characters, players, uh, religions, regions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you create a sense that the Germanic, the various 20 or so Germanic tribes at play here um, are different from one another, like without, again, without bogging the reader down because, and I, I say that because, you know, we, we have generally speaking a very well-defined picture in our minds in Western mm -hmm. civilization of Rome, right? Yeah. Um, but the Germanic tribes that they're not homogenous in the no. popular conception. And I mean, I know there's truth to that and, and, 
not truth to that in terms of Rome, but whatever. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds. Yeah. But there really were like so many different factions, for lack of a better term, within what would become Germania. So, so how totem. how how do you how do you make them distinct from one another? Totems is a big thing. Uh, they all worship the same god. Well, not all of them. They all worship most worship the same gods. Uh, there are different variations depending on what parts of Germania that you go into. They would worship different gods, but for the most part, it's the consistent pantheon. At least the gods that are within this area. And one thing that's interesting um, is so many gods are the same god with different names with slightly different powers but the same sort of overall ranking in the pantheon as you move from one to the other uh mm -hmm. so we stuck primarily with the core gods of the germanic pantheon i think we mentioned vidar like the god of shadows and vengeance uh we mentioned wotan uh who is like odin uh, god of Thunderbolts, Warfare, but the predominant war god would have been Donar, who is like Donar's big god of war. Um, so we mentioned Donar a few times. Uh, <clears throat> there's a really cool scene in the second issue, which comes out in two weeks, I should mention, uh, that it honestly is my favorite page in the whole series. <laughs> and it's like, it's super dark and super violent because uh, well, I, before I get there, Making the individual, like making the, the different tribal entities pop. Uh, hair is a big factor. There's the Swabian peoples are known for the Swabian knot. And they would tie their hair and it would come down in, in a knot. like, And it was the warrior's braid. And they would braid their hair in the front and it would hang down to the front and the side. The Swabian knot. And they found bodies in bogs with the Swabian knot still tied in their hair. Uh, there were also tribes that bound they're always bound their skulls to like indent the skull to give them a ridge over the eyes to make them more fearsome that was something else that happened so those little details are predominant in the story uh but the the way a lot of these tribal entities would like identify themselves with in battle was with what was on their shields uh and it was easier to identify them because the symbology on the shield is the same and that became a thing that we had to discuss a lot about how, because I, and I remember the way I wrote it in the script and then Allison's note was, that's actually a good idea. That's true. So I wrote that the Shirutsi tribe, Shirutsi is a derivative of heart, the deer and the deers that feed on the buds of the tree of life, which is what makes these deers so wise and so powerful. And so all of the symbology with the Shirutsi tribe has to do with deers. There's always deer antlers painted on things. And that becomes a part of the story when they're trying to identify who is who across a field of battle. And they're reading what's on the shield. And there's a Gallic character that we introduce in the second issue named Ippo. And he is the one who's pointing out because he's much more familiar uh, with what's going on than the other two people that are involved in this specific scene. He goes, look what's there, look what's there. So that was kind of a way of us bringing the reader into this world to make these things more identifiable. Because on the yeah. surface, and partially intentional, partially intentional is to do like this blanket wash because I really do feel that we've gotten in this idea of looking at generalities rather than specifics. There's these tiny little things that people do to differentiate themselves that are really important to those people. And I think that sure. like rather than doing like giving them T-shirts with their their tribe name on it, like this is the more respectful way of doing it is actually including those things on there. And mm -hmm. there's certain uh, tribes, the warriors always fought naked. So we made sure to include that in there, too. And there's a really great awesome. scene with a whole bunch of naked people running out of the woods. Given her. You know, that would definitely throw your opponent off of their game. Yeah. So this is what this was our first. We had to put the brakes on something and get permission uh, <laughs> from Eric at Image Central for this. Uh, so so with Shadowline, Jim was very much like, "Cool, this is fine. I'm okay with it." But I got to check. So one of the things that Berserkers would do is they would take magic mushrooms or they would make mushroom tea, mm -hmm. and one of the mushrooms that they believed that they were consuming 
priapism. So they would be fully erect and they're fully naked. And so we had to get permission. I know we had to get permission <laughs> to show this group of frightening individuals running yeah. out of the woods, completely naked, fully at attention because I was very adamant that that was in there. <laughs> I was like, this is a thing that happened and it's scary. And I want it in there. And there's all these like elements in there that I wanted to include because like we talk about historical accuracy, I want that in there because I know that there's people that are going to turn the page and go, Oh my. <laughs> and that's what they're going to see. And that's what I want. Like that's real, you know? So that needed to be in there too. When you're talking about giving credence, that's what I wanted to do. Really, very, put the very cool. on things I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that that is that is uh, highly commendable um, craftsmanship on your part. You know. Yep. Chat. Oh, so um, was there a character or a certain part of the story that kind of really grabbed you, and you know you? Um, well, let's go with character. I mean, there's you've talked a lot about a lot of, about the different characters that you know have, will sh have shown or will show up. Is there one character that became, I guess, became a favorite? I really love Honoria. I love the Honoria. Like I love all of the characters. I really do. Uh, and I love Honoria in terms of fun to write. And it was a real challenge for me because uh, I think a lot of times as a dude you're trying to write a female character that's strong and powerful. And what ends up happening is you write this really one dimensional character that is all mean and all aggression all the time. And that's really flat and doesn't work. And it was a great exercise for me as a writer to create this well-rounded character uh, from a different time and a different perspective uh, that I'm totally unfamiliar with. That was a real challenge for me as a writer and I really enjoyed the process. Uh, and the interesting thing about the Honoria character, and there's also a character called Regulus that I wrote as well. Um, those characters are not Roman, but they fight for Rome. Um, and they are very pragmatic characters. And they were difficult to write because I didn't want to write a story that made Rome seem like it was this great place where everything was awesome for everybody because it was definitely absolutely 100% not. not. It was not. <laughs> like you could argue whether they were worse than everyone else or whether they're just more successful than everyone else, but it was not great for everyone at all. And you've got these characters that are seemingly very dedicated and loyal to this this entity that is brutal and cruel to everybody. Why? And so the challenge for me uh, was to give these characters plausible reasons that made sense and were accessible to the reader for why are they so loyal to something that they're technically not even a part of. And that I think was the, the funnest part was creating a, a situation for those characters to thrive. Uh, and Honoria in particular. And um, there's the thing about the Honoria character was that she was born a slave, but she was born a slave to Hellenic aristocracy in, in Syria. Because at the time, Syria was Greek because of Alexander's conquest. It was all like the Babylonian influence had diminished because it was now Hellenic. Uh, and when the Romans came in, now she's now she belongs to this Roman family. But in the course of being part of this Roman family, she's given opportunities that were never present before. And she's given there's a really interesting there's been a lot of writing about this, about how uh, the Germans were very confused by slaves of Rome being so dedicated and loyal when they were still technically slaves, but being a slave in Rome didn't mean you were just a slave and that was it. There was a whole multitude of degrees 
there were members of the household and they touched on that in game of thrones as well when the guy's like i was treated with respect i was a teacher i was an educator now i'm nothing and it's like that is the element that i wanted to convey but i wanted to convey it in a very balanced way where while you've got one person saying this is the best for me the other person but you could have more if you just mm -hmm. came here. And so it became like, just by the process of creating the characters really fueled the story as opposed to the plot. You know, the plot was really mapped out. It was the story really derived from the characters themselves, which was, the it's they're always like, that's the way the story should be. And I'm always like, yeah, it is. And then in the process of writing this, that is what happened. I was like, it's happening. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really fun. I found it therapeutic. Was Honoria based on an actual person, or is she more of a pastiche of different people? Mm, yes, yeah, she is. She's not even real. Yeah, she's kind of a pastiche. She's a, a plausible pastiche okay. uh, character. Um, and so the Honoria character was someone that I wanted to have in because I wanted to have the intrigue of Rome. Uh, there's always talk about the frumentarii who are agents, military operatives, the spies that go out in the field. And the, there's, they get intel without the enemy realizing intel is being gathered. Uh, and Honoria's character, she is a member of the governor's household. She is a spy. She is a courtesan. She is an assassin. She is a gatherer of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And she was assigned to spy on Arminius because Varys does not trust anybody. And she was assigned to keep an eye and keep tabs on this guy. And over the course of keeping tabs on this guy, he's so different than the Roman generals who are there to fight for the glory of their household. And I think that maybe before Arminius even got to Germania, he was that guy too. But once he gets to Germania, he becomes infused with this sense of home, this sense of homeland and his kin and his family. And he wants to elevate his people. He wants to make them better than Rome. But it's not just for him, it's for them. But right. will it stay that way? Oh, who knows? Was it all an act? We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> if only there was historical record. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's a problem with the historical record is it's so contradicting. Like right. there's some some arguments that say Tudorburg was a was one battle. And then there's some that say it was like a week and then there's some that say it was 2 days and then 4 days. So it's hard to get the facts. So we sort of like we kind of read as much and then picked the middle of a little bit of everything. So the story's <laughs> a pastiche, I guess you could say. I mean, You've done your homework. And we did a lot of too you much know, homework. We're, we're talking about something that happened like over 2,000 years ago. So yeah. if yeah. you feel validated in your work, I'd say you yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> so again, looking at this from a broader historical scope, I know that the Germanic tribes, like eventual sacking of Rome about 300 or so years later yeah, the um, is, is kind of like generally attributed to the downfall of Rome among other things, of course. But um, does the, does the battle of T Tudorborg have like, a, is it a historical precedent for what would eventually happen? hundred percent. Okay. hundred percent it does. Uh, and you can draw like a few lines and, and if you got a professor of history, they could do a way better job of this than me. But like, let's get this is a perfect example. Uh, if you take a look in um, like Prussia, one of the tribes that what is what is, became Prussia, one of the tribes that was there were the Langobardi, uh, and the Langobardi were eventually part of the big uh, Vandal migration that went south. Mm -hmm. uh, the northern Italians are often called Lombards. Where do you think the Lombards came from? The Langobardi, that's what they are. They're the Langobardi, and they came down and they resettled. Uh, and had had the Romanic Empire been not thrown out, they would have been consumed by the empire, and that probably never would have happened. Or maybe it would, just in a different way. We don't know. So the long-term implications of what happened there are profound. The, the groundwork for things that happened hundreds of years later begin with the Battle of Tudorburg Forest. And and then I know I, I know the Romans 
did kind of come back up into Germ- yeah. the Germanic area. They hung so, out a little bit, but they didn't they, exactly they did. put their boot down. Well, they put it down. They just moved back afterwards. So okay, okay. there's there's a guy. Um, so you take a look. You've got Emperor Augustus, and Augustus has his uh, stepson, Tiberius. Uh, and Tiberius uh, succeeds him as uh, emperor. Uh, Tiberius has a nephew uh, who is uh, Germanicus. Uh, I think I'm getting this right because all the big Roman houses are, there's a lot of intermarriage between a lot of them and a lot of names that end in U.S. Um, (laughs) But so (laughs) Germanicus, this was the guy tasked with Augustus to avenge Rome. And so he went north and where Varus had three legions because so many were down in, I think, Dacia and Pannonia dealing with a big uh, war there that lasted like four years and ended with a stalemate. Not even a stalemate, but a, a favorable peace, but for Rome, but not everything they wanted. Uh, so Germanicus goes back up and there's a lot of factors that are at play when the Romans go back. So one of the big factors is that the, the legions uh, have a lot of loyalties to the local area, which is bad because if a revolt breaks out, how do you know who they're going to be loyal to? They're also mad because they don't think that they're getting paid enough. And so when Germanicus goes up there, he goes, you know what? I'll pay you out of my pocket. I will give you my money. So he does. He does give them money. And he gets just enough loyalty out of them to go across the Rhine in the early fall and just lay waste to everything close by. Loot, pillage, destroy, ravage the land. And let the Germans know we're coming back in the spring and it's going to be worse. And so he gives all the legions a taste of blood and then he lets them loot. And he lets them loot and he lets them take gold and wealth because he knows that if he tells them, we're going to go even farther in the spring, they're going to be like, well, we can take even more stuff. Why would I leave and revolt now? I'm ready to get rich and cash. Yeah, let's do this. So then he organizes a massive, massive invasion the following spring, which actually used like transports overseas and coming down the Elbe. And he coordinates a massive invasion. And they go back in, and there was a huge, huge battle with Germanicus and uh, Arminius their armies, and it sort of ends in a stalemate. You can find versions that say the Germans won. You can find versions that say uh, the Romans won. It's called like the Battle of the Long Bridge because there was a big causeway through one of the swamps. And Arminius laid a trap. Germanicus knew it was going to be a trap, prepared for it, but marched into it anyways. And they had their big fight. And then it became a standstill. But then Germanicus didn't wait. He regrouped, came back in right away, fought two more big battles, and I forget their names right now, But the first one was a defeat. The second one was a really big defeat against Arminius. And then he was called back. Now you can, you can find different versions of the story that says he was called back because the weather was turning. He called back because of casualties uh, or he was called back by Tiberius himself. But when he came back, he was, he was planning to go back in again because now Tiberius was the emperor and he was planning on going back in again. I'm going to take over everything. But Tiberius, some would say that he realized the costs of the war were too much for what they could get when they already had Roman territory that just needed to be solidified that was already settled and they could get lots of wealth from. Right. Yeah. Some say that he was worried that Germanicus was becoming too powerful. Um, And so he was sent to Anatolia. Uh, And eventually he wound up in Egypt where I'm really getting into the nerdy stuff here, guys. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I could, like, uh, I'm a I could say, right now. <laughs> this seems under-researched. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> this is all the stuff that happened after. So then, like, they never went back in after that, but the Romans were very good at making their enemies fight each other, so they didn't need to fight them to begin with. So you just give money to this person, you give money to that person, you give a trade deal to that person, and you just make them all fight amongst each other. And it's like there's like an Irish proverb, and it's about how when your enemies fight amongst themselves, drink and be at ease. When they're of one mind, put stones on the wall. And it's like that idea, the Romans knew that if they're all fighting each other, we don't need to worry about it. Let them all fight each other. It's fine. 
Yeah. So they went back in, but they never tried to turn Germania into a province again after that. Very cool, man. So I I understand that there, there's um, an idea for a follow-up arc. There is. Um, and I may have been dropping hints about what it might be about just there. No way. So <laughs> um, but um, – Let's let's just go for the gold. Let's say that this this thing gets greenlit just as an ongoing series. I mean, how how far could you take this? Like, how many issues of Dead Romans do you have in you? Uh, Obviously, the wealth of information rattling around your brain. Uh, that I you think for with. this story. So I think for this story, because it's at its core, it's not the story of Roman German politics. It's the story of Honoria and Arminius. And I think for that to be the case, I really think Dead Romans should only have one more arc. I really okay. believe that. And I and I say that like I could do other stories about Rome and call them Dead Romans, but they wouldn't be about Honoria or Arminius because that wouldn't make any sense because their story can be completed in those two arcs. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, let's just say they're like, everyone loves Dead Romans. It's so good. Can you do a third arc, I would respond by saying, I can, but it wouldn't be about these two characters or we would right. have to backtrack and focus on just one of them because there's a lot of things that I would love to do with Honoria's character in particular about how did she get that position in her household? Mm -hmm. Like we sort of tease at what set her on the path in the story, but what are the things that she did? And in terms of telling, like, I love spy stories. Like, and I'm getting the sense that you guys like Andor and love spy stories, too. I love Cold War <laughs> spy that? stories. It's one of my favorite genres is Cold War spy stories. And I would love, love to do some stories about Honoria as, like, the dagger in the dark, which is a term that she actually describes herself as. Like, I w didn't have power. I was power. And it's like that character like seeing her do what she does is almost like like a spy in ancient rome would be great i would love it like getting out of hairy situations i could do more <laughs> stories about just her yeah i could do more stories about just him but to have the two of them together i really think we've only got a second arc but there's always stories about honoria that i could do i love her character a lot I, I like that because what you basically just posited is turning uh, dead Romans into um, criminal, but for Roman. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's the do same it, yeah. universe, but different corners of it with each arc or every couple. Absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, there's so many great stories to tell about the Roman Empire. Okay, sure. it's laying out like groundwork plans. <laughs> uh, years ago, I was at a con talking with Becky Clunan, and she talked about how she'd always wanted to do a story about Boudicca. And I've always said that, if, do you guys, are you familiar with Boudicca? Boudicca was a, a Briton. She was a Briton around like 60 AD. Oh. And uh, her I, family I'm, was I'm too much of a nerd. <laughs> I was thinking about the Green Lantern. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, okay, yeah, yeah. I should have, yeah. So she was a Briton and her family was murdered by Rome and she led a massive revolt that in the wow. end was not successful. Uh, but the story of Boudicca is just pretty badass. And that's a story that I would like to do too. Okay. Uh, there's all kinds of things that I would love to do that are set in the Roman time period in particular, but we'll have to wait and see. I, I like, I, I love how much support the book has been getting. Uh, and I love to see the the passion for the history and whatnot. So yeah, we'll wait and see. Cool. If, uh, if they yeah. ask me to do another another arc after that, I will do it. I promise. I'm telling <laughs> you right now, if they ask, Nerd. I'll do it. Yeah, saddle up. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions. Chad, uh, drop one more on our man. Uh, so, besides history buffs. Who would you, who do you think would uh, be the perfect audience for this book? Horror fans. I think horror fans would absolutely love it. And I say that because there's tons of horror elements. It's a horrific city, se setting. The Germans, the, the Romans were scared of Tudorburg Forest. They were terrified. They thought that it was filled with dark spirits and evil entities and things that go bump in the night. They were terrified mm -hmm. of even going into Tudorburg Forest. 
And this is the setting. You are dealing with a swamp, a bog that is constantly under storms and rains. And you are hiding in the mud, in the reeds, as all around you, you can hear the screams of the dead and the dying. Because it's not like you got captured and you're like, oh, well, time for you to go do things. Like, no, they sacrificed you. Like, bit by bit, literally cutting pieces off of you as you were still alive to give them to the gods because your pain is what made those sacrifices valid. There's, there's a really rad scene uh, in the in the second issue where you really get a good glimpse of what is happening to everyone that got captured and it is horrible absolutely horrible and throughout the story you see in the background and it's like we want it to be unsettling there's mm-hmm. so much horrific unsettling thing and this is the thing is you can read a book that has all kinds of body horror and has all kinds of supernatural elements. There's nothing supernatural here. This is just the horrible, horrible things that people do to each other. And, and it's all there. And the when you take a look at the history, when they went back in, they found like bodies just nailed the trees. Like just nailed to the, to the trees. That's just what they did. And they were just left there alive. Yeah. And it's like, constant horrible things happening all of the time so there's it, it really does appeal to horror fans sure um so I, I aside from just history buffs it will definitely appeal to fans of horror if you like action if you like adventure and i think that you know there are a lot of us that i i've said this before like i can't understand what it's like to be a cavalry officer and go to war with an empire but right. no it's like to love somebody and be willing to do anything to be with that person Mm-hmm. So I think there's anybody who like has always been imbued with like that level of passion before will definitely have something resonating in the book when they read it. Dude, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So um, final question. Mm-hmm. What is it about the Rome and the Roman empire and just that particular period of history? Do you think keeps it evergreen in our pop culture decade after decade? Um, because everything that you've ever read in fantasy, in sci-fi, period, you always read these things where they talk about, oh, there was an ancient race that was so wise and powerful. Like, that is such a trope. That is all Rome. And the thing was is that the Romans thought that about Egypt, and the medieval people thought that about the Romans. Um, and growing up where I grew up, there was a road by, in town that was built by the Romans that was still used. Oh, wow. And so you see these aqueducts that were made by people that had a better understanding of architecture, mathematics, and technology than anyone did for another thousand years, Um, at least in Western Europe. We can get into a very fascinating conversation about math and stuff if we want to. (laughs) But the- Another time. That idea, like when you talk about when you're reading The Lord of the Rings and Gimli is going into, uh, like, they're going into Numenor, not Numenor, when they're going into, uh, what's it called? The big city, the the Minas Tirith. Oh, Minas Tirith. Yeah, when they're going into the gates of Gondor. Why am I unable to remember that? (laughs) So, zero nerd credibility. Talk about Tiberius, but can't remember Gondor. What kind of idiot is this guy? This so guy. So when uh, Gimli's going into Gondor, he notes, look at this stonework. This old stonework is fantastic, but this new stuff isn't as good. That is classic medieval architecture being built onto Roman architecture. Like, the, it's so ingrained. You even watch the Gummy Bears. When you watch the Gummy Bears cartoon, they're talking about the wisdom of the ancient gummies. All that stuff comes from like the idea of people looking back at Rome and wondering how are they so smart and why are we so dumb now? You know, (laughs) so that I think that is why I think we're like ingrained into it, you know. And there's always a sense of wanting to like look back. I don't know if it's like a root of nostalgia or what it is, but there was a need to like look back at things, you know. Yeah, most definitely. And it looks cool. It just looks cool. cool. And the show, Rome, was really cool. Yeah. 
Um, but this is a really special and really unique comic. And and you and Nick and Allison and, and just the whole team uh, really ought to be proud of what you've done. I mean, we've only gotten to see the first issue so far. You know what the finished product looks like. So I'm not probably not telling you anything that you don't know. But um, I'm having, glad to hear it, though. I still like hearing it. Uh, yes. Let me let me just pat your back a little bit. Um, but uh, this is a cool comic, and it stands out on the shelves because there really is nothing else like it going on right now. And where, where can we where can we find you on the on social media? Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at fearless underscore Fred, uh, and I'm on there. And my my profile is like a little cat. I'm a little happy yeah. cat. Because I put that at the beginning of the pandemic, I put that because I was like, everyone's so angry. I'm gonna put this happy little cat on here so people can know that I'm a happy little guy. That's happy awesome. Little guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy little Belgian. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Fred, thank you so much for um taking time with us this evening to talk about Dead Romans, which thank you for letting me. Uh, we could yes. honestly probably do like a whole separate podcast of just the history of it, but yeah, um, it would be like you talking for 58 <laughs> and Chad. I, this is the thing. I, I know it's people awesome. that are way better. My wife has a cousin with an antiquities degree. And if you oh, think sure. I know my stuff, she's been on <laughs> digs in like Turkey and Greece. You should talk to her, dude. She's really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Bring her with you next time. I'll get her on the line, man. Do it. Ar do it. Archaeology well, watch. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it, Chad. <laughs> the comic is Dead Romans. Issue number one is in shops now. Uh, the writer and creator is Mr. Fred Kennedy. Fred, thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. Uh, guess what? Chad and I will be back tomorrow with a bonus episode for this week. Please do tune in because we're talking about the rock gods of Tennessee. And um, until next time, read something cool because... Uh, you know, it's the right thing to do. You just want to read cool stuff. You want to get out there. You want to go support your library. You want to get out there, support your uh, local comic book store. But above all thing, other things, it exposes you to something new. And there is always, there is never anything uncool about that. So till next time, thank you kindly. <laughs>